Welcome everyone. My name is Paige and I'm a Deschutes Public Library and I'm joined today by Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas, author of The Dark Fantastic, Race and Imagination from Harry Potter to the Hunger Games. We're so very excited that you're here. Ebony, thank you. This is great to have you. Yes, thanks for having me, Paige. It's lovely because through the miracle of technology, we're able mm -hmm. to have events like this virtually on the opposite sides of the same continent. So yes, you are in uh, Eastern time and we're over here in Pacific time. And normally we wouldn't be able to do this, but one of the good things that has come out of all of this is that we get to connect in spaces we might not normally be able to. Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas is Associate Professor in the Literacy, Culture and International Education Division at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. A former Detroit Public Schools teacher and National Academy of Education slash Spencer Foundation postdoctoral fellow, she was a member of the NCTE Cultivating New Voices Among Scholars of Colors 2008 to 2010 cohort served on the NCTE Conference on Education, on English Education's Executive Committee from 2013 until 2017, and is the immediate past chair of the NCT Standing Committee on Research. Currently, she serves as co-editor of Research of the Teaching of English, and her most recent book is The Dark Fantastic, Race and the Imagination from Harry Potter to the Hunger Games from NYU Press 2019. So Ebony, go ahead and take it away. Uh, we are going to start off with a reading here and I will be in the background. Uh, so if you have questions throughout, please put them in the Q&A and take it away, Ebony. Hi, it is so wonderful to be here with you virtually um, from three hours in the future um, in the uh, Eastern time zone, as Paige said in Philadelphia. And let me tell you about what the future is like um, having, you know, since I'm three hours ahead, um, it's pretty boring. Um, <laughs> I always like to make that joke about time differences. Not a very good one. I'm so thrilled to be here with your library to talk about my 2019 book, um, The Dark Fantastic, Race and the Imagination from Harry Potter to the Hunger Games. Um, it was published by New York University Press on their post-millennial pop book series. Um, I'm going to do a couple of readings. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read from the introduction first, and then I think we're going to stop for Q&A. Um, Paige and I will talk about the book, and then I will read um, from the last chapter and then we will take your questions. Introduction, The Dark Fantastic, Race and the Imagination Gap. There is no magic. This statement, perhaps most famously attributed to Harry Potter's uncle, Vernon Dursley, is also something that my mother has said to me since I was a child. Magic has long been under siege in my culture, social class, and hometown. The eldest daughter of an African-American working class Detroit family, I was born in the late 1970s, just as the fires of the civil rights era were smoldering to ashes. My mother was doing me a favor by letting me know that magic was inaccessible to me. The real world held trouble enough for young black girls, so there was no need for me to go off on a quest to seek it. I was warned against walking through metaphoric looking glasses, trained to be suspicious of magic rings, and assured that no gallant princes were ever coming to my rescue. The existential concerns of our family, neighbors, and city left little room for Neverlands, Middle Earths, or Fantasias. In order to survive, I had to accept reality. My life has been intentionally constructed to prove my mother's words wrong. Among my earliest memories are snapshots taken from the behind the spectacles of my younger self, 
seeking desperately for any traces of magic in the real world, even when magic did not seem to search for or take much notice of me. Secret passageways remained closed off to me, but I continued to dream. Books were my ticket to the realm of imagination, reading a welcomed escape. Although I grew up in urban America during the height of the crack epidemic of the 1980s and 1990s, my heart, mind, and soul were almost always somewhere else. In the realm of the fantastic, I found meaning, safety, catharsis, and hope. Though it eluded me, I needed magic. My emerging critical consciousness as a reader, creative writer, and fangirl were soon on a collision course with my experiences as a teacher, scholar, and critic. The promise from Disney's classic Cinderella film, in dreams you will lose your heartache, whatever you wish for, you keep was obscured by the real conditions of my existence as a young black woman in early 21st century America. It was also obscured in the lives of my family and friends and in the lives of many children and adults whom I knew. Perhaps this is why some of my students, family members and friends have been especially ambivalent about speculative fiction. They prefer to read and view stories that are in their words, true to life or keeping it real. Although there are many exceptions to this conventional wisdom about Black readers and viewers genre preferences, the recent Black Panther phenomenon for one, I have been told throughout my lifetime that stories like the ones I preferred were for white people. When people of color seek passageways into the fantastic, we have often discovered that the doors are barred for us. Even the very act of dreaming of worlds that never were can be challenging when the known world does not provide many liberating spaces. One example comes from Marlon Riggs's Emmy Award winning 1986 documentary about racial representation in media, ethnic notions. Toward the end of the film, there is a haunting sequence in which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech is interposed over Ethel Waters' ethereal performance of Darkies Never Dream in the 1943 movie Cabin in the Sky. While others have read her performance through the lens of minstrelsy, for me, it was almost as if Ethel's haunting melody was audaciously pointing to the possibility of the undarkened future of King's March on Washington and beyond it to our time, a time when all people would ostensibly have access to the pleasures of dreaming. But are the cartographies of dreams truly universal? When we dream inside the storied worlds of printed and digital books, fan fiction, fan art, fan videos, television shows, movies, comics, graphic novels, online fandom communities, and fan cons, do those worlds offer all kinds of people escape from the world as we know it? Could they offer catharsis for some of our most pressing human problems? Might they help us collectively imagine our world anew? That's the first excerpt from the first chapter that I'd like to read. And later on, I'm happy to read a little more. That was fantastic, absolutely. And Ebony, what, what do you think is the book, if there is one, uh, that, that really started it all for this exploration and this journey from all your thrilling thoughts and feelings about this, this really important topic that you've been thinking about for quite a while, how did you get it condensed into this one magical book? 
So this book has been about um, 15 years in the making and dreaming, and it was five years in the writing. So originally, I had hoped that this would be a dissertation topic when mm -hmm. I first started graduate school in 2005. I was toward the end of my time as a Harry Potter fandom um, personality. Mm -hmm. So I wrote fan fiction. I was a board moderator. I was a frequent um, interlocutor. Um, in fandom discussions that were both polite and controversial. And um, Harry Potter was one of the very first digital age fandoms. Other uh, uh, mass pop culture fandoms predated um, the internet's social web or the earliest forms of the social web. I think arguably Harry Potter, Buffy, and a few others um, were really entering the digital space where we were interacting online, where you didn't have to go to one of the comic cons or mm -hmm. know about buying zines in order to participate. So um, Harry Potter was sort of a culmination of my childhood reading. I was 22 when I picked up my first Harry Potter book because it was 2000 and I was in my first year as a fifth grade teacher. And mm -hmm. one of my students left that book um, in the classroom or, you know, sort of, you know, the doorstep right at my classroom. Mm -hmm. And none of the kids owned up to whose book it was. So, you know, probably it was a kid whose parent was trying to make them read and they didn't want to read it. Anyway, long story short, I took the book home with me. It was winter break. It was cold. I wasn't really going many places or doing much. Um, and I devoured the whole thing quite quickly, went to Borders Bookstore at the time and mm -hmm. purchased the other two. And, um, you know, since then I, I, you know, um, I would advocate that your audience go to independence and to um, libraries. So mm. I um, had to put the plug in page. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I um, devoured all three books and I began reading them over and over and over. I don't know why. I just really fell straight in love with the wizarding world. And I got uh, Harry Potter, Potter and the Goblet of Fire um, immediately upon release on, you know, in um, July 2000 and fell down the rabbit hole of this fandom. I tell that story um, at the end of the book and I'll read a little bit about that later. But um, yeah, it was Harry Potter was the first, I mean, the last book I fell in love with. That was fantastic. But I think before that, and I've told this story before, but elsewhere, um, Anne of Green Gables and everything Lucy Maud Montgomery wrote, although um, it's not fantastic. It's, you know, sort of idealized, um, mm -hmm. you know, girl stories. Um, mm -hmm. I really, really um, never got over um, Lucy Maud Montgomery as mm -hmm. a girl. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, just her style of writing. There was a lot of the fantastic in, um, in her. And, you know, I read everything. Like I read a lot of genre in the 10 years between reading the Anne stories and reading Harry Potter, right, mm -hmm. in my teens. So I read Lord of the Rings, I read mm -hmm. Terry Brooks, I read Ursula Le Guin, mm -hmm. read Octavia Butler and everything mm -hmm. that was available to Nana mm -hmm. Reed, do and so many others. But, you know, sort of this um, magical world or this idyllic world was always something I was searching for. I remember you mentioned Anne of Green Gables in your book and I thought that was, such an interesting uh, story to hear you latched on to because uh, comparatively to all the other strong empowered female characters Anne is quite different um, and yet not not so different right she's very resourceful uh, she's very witty uh, she has her own struggles and feeling like an outcast um, but I thought I thought that was great that you mentioned her here because she is mentioned in the book so you have, this is a sweeping book. This is a, a fantastic book that is, pardon, pardon the puns, um, <laughs> that really gets um, compartmentalized. It's broken down, pieced out into an examination of four, let's call them fandoms, uh, four worlds. We have The Hunger Games, we have Harry Potter, we also have Merlin, the BBC series, and, um, 
we have, oh no, what's the next one? Well, I wrote partially about Angelina Johnson in Yes, thank you. But I mainly used her as a jumping off point to talk about restoring and what kids mm -hmm. were doing online. And the vampire diaries. Yes. Um, so th I thought this was a fascinating way to look at this central idea of how black characters are depicted in these fantastic worlds uh, when you have multimedia. So we're working not only with books, but books that have gone to screen. And you talk about how they're different there and like readers reactions to how certain characters are made black and people are actually saying in like Twitter threads, like, I don't know why they made the best characters black. That's not supposed to be like that. I was shocked to see this, but I was really fascinated um, by the way, how how you took a multimedia approach, you weren't just looking at literature. How did you decide on that structure for this book? So here, I need to give my dissertation co-chairs a huge public apology, because when I wrote The Dark Fantastic, this was the book that I thought I would write, you know, um, the first version of as my PhD thesis, but then I ended up, you know, not researching programs very well. I'm a first generation graduate student, right? And so no one at my school was an expert in children's literature or in media and communication. So I ended up for, I took a five year detour. <laughs> Um, this is why the book is so unusual and why, yeah, because yeah, I just, I had these weird experiences in the 20 years since joining Harry Potter fandom. So anyway, mm -hmm. I landed at University of Michigan and um, ended up working with um, Ann Ruggles Gear, who is still the department chair. She's a rhetorician, composition scholar. I worked with Leslie Rex, who is now retired. I'm going to get back to Leslie because I owe her a decade's worth of edible arrangements. And um, uh, Mary Schleppergirl, um, who is a linguist. So going back to Leslie Rex, who is now retired. She's emerita. Leslie is a student of Judith Green, who is pretty famous mm -hmm. in educational research. Um, whenever I see or talk to Judith, uh, we joke, I'm her academic grandchild. She's my academic grandmother. She is the founder of the Santa Barbara Classroom Discourse Group and okay. the originator of a research method called interactional ethnography. It wasn't until The Dark Fantastic was published and people were asking me, well, how did you know how to weave in between, you know, because I use these three contexts, the text itself, I look at how it went from page to screen and what happened to race when um, popular texts are um, transmediated or adapted for either film or television. And then I look at these digital fan communities and I'm analyzing what's going on and people, you know, and I say that method is critical race counter storytelling. Mm -hmm. If I ever get to revise this or add a second forward, I need to give some credit mm -hmm. to the five years I spent training with Leslie because as much as I, you know, this book is part of my pre-PhD training at Wayne State University as a literary scholar and someone thinking about the long 19th century and girls text, mm. it is very, my uh, methods and the way that I was able to know you need to look at things across these different contexts in order to make sense of a phenomenon and analyze yeah. across and, mm -hmm. uh, is very much interactional um, ethnography. Um, mm -hmm. And it's why I chose to go deep or write the longer chapters about a few um, yeah. of those girls instead of doing what some people wanted me to do, which was to provide a comprehensive look mm -hmm. at the entire fantastic or the entirety of the speculative. I think those books are great in mm -hmm. one sense, but if you're trying to analyze um, a phenomenon, one of the strengths of interactional ethnography is that it requires us to look at context and you can't, it's difficult to look at context if we're looking at, okay, I'm getting too academic, but so it's, it's harder if you like say, okay, here are the hundred books with black characters, fantasy mm -hmm. books with black characters published over the past hundred years. That's a different kind of book than saying, let's follow the paths of these girls mm -hmm. from page onto screen, and then let's see how people talk about them online.
it's a different yeah. thing get a different book so anyway. but I think it it worked so so very well because it's these contemporary examples are very different from like an examination of Octavia Butler um, but it serves our contemporary audience so well because of the way you framed it within the fan fiction people get so invested in that it is really a subculture and I feel it has just as much a credit to it as what the author's original intent is. Um, what do you do you have any thoughts real quick? This is a slight divergence on Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, the play adaptation that came after. Are you familiar with it? I know I you mentioned know. Hamilton, but what are your thoughts on on that as fan fiction and on the how it translated to the stage? So a little later in the hour, I'm going to read a little bit from that chapter. Um, I do think that, um, first of all, I think I gave JK Rowling much more credit in the book than we're seeing <laughs> lately in popular culture. And without getting um, too political with your audience, I just want to say I disagree with just about everything she has said about identity <laughs> in 2020. I disagree. And I have to say that publicly during talks since my book has Harry Potter in the title, right? Yeah. So I um, value and affirm my queer, trans, and non-binary readers, family members, mm -hmm. neighbors, friends, colleagues, um, and um, fellow fans. So I think that has to be said. I'll begin with that. <laughs> Having said that, one of the theories I have gotten um, known for at mid-career or as a mid-career academic is the theory of restoring which was mm -hmm. my attempt, along with my colleague, Amy Scorniaiolo, who is a digital literacy scholar, we wanted to find out what young people were doing um, mm -hmm. in response to a literary and media landscape where they were relegated only to certain roles or certain kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. And so what we found was fandom um, is just one instantiation of the ways that young people are reading and writing their, uh, the self into existence in mm -hmm. the uh, face of persistent um, textual um, erasure or marginalization. Mm -hmm. So that means that um, we saw it from um, young people who insisted that Hermione was black. Um, mm -hmm. which was a reading, as I say in the chapter, I it, it was not accessible to me as mm -hmm. um, someone who is late generation X. I grew up mostly before the internet. There was internet access when I was in high school, so Prodigy existed, but almost no one I knew had it. So I think mm -hmm. I knew one girl who had Prodigy in high school. But so that means that we were some of the very last folks to grow up in the analog world, which means that when we read the only people we could talk to about what we read were our friends, family members, classmates, people in the neighborhood, but you know, you weren't having random book conversations. Nothing like the environment of the past 20 to 25 years existed mm -hmm. back then. So even if someone had a fleeting thought, yeah, you know, maybe Her Hermione could be black, there was nothing reinforcing in the culture. Contrast that with the girls who were about 10 to 15 years younger than us, who could have that fleeting thought, hop online, mm -hmm. and back then it was live journal or message boards or, you know, mm -hmm. Tumblr was very popular early in the 2010s, um, mm -hmm. and they affirmed each other. And, um, you know, they amplified those conversations on Twitter, and Twitter is where all hope for our species goes to die, but it also <laughs> is a place where, I mean, I'm an avid tweeter. Um, mm -hmm. It is also a place where we've seen the culture change for mm -hmm. better and for worse, certainly for worse, but, you know, for better too. So people were saying, you know, tweeting at JK Rowling and others, mm -hmm. um, you know, Hermione is black. And then um, she affirmed in via Twitter back then, mm -hmm you know, before the recent remarks, she affirmed that, yeah, Hermione could be Black. And so I, you know, um, noted not just that, oh, you know, Rowling is so woke, because that wasn't it. That's not the point. Look mm -hmm. at how these young Black girls' emancipatory readings, so they were reading into the text, 
fundamentally changed the semantic meaning mm -hmm. of the words or the original authorial intent on the page. That's deep. I mean, I just never, to me, it was revolutionary because I never would have been audacious enough to read myself into mainstream mm -hmm. fantasy. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, aptly put. It, that seems the summation of the entire book uh, really is, <laughs> is this empowerment of, of how we can uh, transport our minds to this new realm that is not built in. It's not given to you. It's not it's not there, it's not accessible, as you mentioned in the introduction. And I think it's fascinating, even um, with authors such as Octavia Butler, uh, Kindred, her work Kindred, one could argue that her main character, Dana, also does her own, is, is the protagonist, she is the hero, and yet she, the character, and her husband find ways to undermine her as a hero and as a protagonist in general. And that's found in so many of these other discourses. Rue is this incredible character who's so smart. She has her survival and then she's used as a foil to the white protagonist. And so she very quickly, uh, the way you put it in the book is that Black characters are given specific roles, and one of them is just to be there until they're sacrificed. And I think that's a really fascinating topic. Do you mind uh, delving into that for our audience a little bit more about the roles that Black characters are kind of shoehorned into? Absolutely. So when I was um, um, first starting to think about how to write this book, originally it was going to be a little bit different. It was going to be a bit more like the kind of book that I mentioned at the beginning mm -hmm. of the session. So um, I felt the need to be very comprehensive. And then I had imagined that the book that you have, Paige, would mm -hmm. be the only the first half of the book. I imagined that I would write a doorstopper, which probably mm -hmm. more people would have read because who's reading doorstoppers? <laughs> you have a lot of time. So the first half of the book, I was going to talk about what was, you know, going on with race in, mm -hmm. um, you know, Anglo-American fantasy. And then the other half of the book that I have yet to write, <laughs> I don't know if I'll write or write it or one of my mentees will write it. Um, I wanted to write about what Black authors were doing. And so I have a mm -hmm. few pieces that have trickled out over in the academic realm. So first to address the point about Octavia Butler mm -hmm. and Dana and Kindred. First of all, one of the challenges with Octavia, who I adore and whose every word I devoured because there was so little on the market when I was a teenager and when I was in my early 20s. First, she didn't write for children. So um, we um, really only could put her in the classroom once kids were in high school, you know, before age 13 or 14, you know, having been a teacher for almost a decade, parents just wouldn't have. Um, so um, because my focus is um, education and uh, children's and young adult literature, one of my, because um, people say, well, there's Octavia Butler back then yeah. in the 90s and the early 2000s, yeah. I would say. But if you are under 15 or 16, it's not even just appropriateness or the content of her work. It's just, would it go over your head just developmentally? Yeah. So um, one of the things that I present in the book is something that I call the dark fantastic cycle. When I first started writing the book, I quickly learned that I wouldn't be able to do a compendium until I actually unraveled what was going on. What would be the argument? What was the kind of... Um, motion I, that I could see um, in each of those narratives, in each of those stories. And so at, um, as you know, the dark fantastic cycle, I propose um, as five stages. The first is um, the spectacle of the character of color appearing in um, the fantastic, especially the mainstream fantastic. So look, you know, like, because we, traditionally weren't there, at least not mm -hmm. up front and center. Um, the spectacle causes you to hesitate. Um, I was really influenced by um, Todorov's uh, The Fantastic, The Structure of a Literary Genre, which is a classic from 19, uh, the 1970s, from 1973. And mm -hmm. so he talks about nearly reaching the point of believing being the heart mm -hmm. of the uncanny. Mm -hmm. 
So like you, you know, it, ha it can't be something when you read a book that's science fiction, fantasy, horror, even, you know, superhero comics, if you read it and your brain can't latch onto something familiar, you're going to put it down. Mm -hmm. If it's too mundane, you're not going to think that it's science fiction or fantasy enough. But, you know, there needs to be some point or some of the elements of our known world need to be off, but there needs to be enough reality to hang our hats on. So that when race is a factor, we're, the racialized character is that point of, uh, that black character is that point of hesitation. Like, mm -hmm. wait a minute, hold up. Why are you mm -hmm. here? Um, that hesitation is dilemmatic and the dilemma has to be reconciled. Like you can't move on with the story if the reader and the viewer audience has stopped like, oh, there's a black person where shouldn't be, shouldn't be there. And generally what happens in narratives is what happens in real life. Um, a black person not a place um, is um, met with violence. Mm. And so we find violence, textual violence against these mm -hmm. characters often in the stories. And then finally, uh, or no, this is step four. Step four is um, haunting. And I got that from Toni Morrison's playing in the dark that, you know, the dark other can't, you know, has to die, but can't die and ends up haunting the narrative. Like, it's not like, well, you know, they're gone, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you, you see resonances of that character's presence in the narrative. And then finally, um, I, I say that, you know, stages one through four sort of cycle back and forth. And we mm -hmm. rarely reach stage five emancipation where the uh, mm -hmm. black character or the, the racialized character is liberated from that cycle mm -hmm. of, of death and violence. I mean, some authors have done it, but mm -hmm. in a recent piece, Notes Toward a Black Fantastic, it's, you can, you know, that's Googleable, it's open access right now. Um, I write about three black authored young adult fantasy novels where black girl dies at the end. Now, some of this is gatekeeping, right? So <laughs> I can't necessarily say these are black women authors killing black women characters. Mm -hmm. But um, we've all been raised with the same kind and educated with the same kinds of stories. We've all had the same stories available to us on the bookshelf. Mm -hmm. So it just means that, you know, this dark, fantastic cycle keeps turning on. Big wheel keep mm -hmm. on turning, you know, like we, yeah. uh, because it's difficult to think your way out of. Nora Jemison did it, N.K. Jemison and mm -hmm. uh, The Broken Earth. She completely writes a different story that deals with every single issue we deal mm -hmm. with in the known world mm -hmm. from a Black woman's perspective. But mm -hmm. have you read it? I have. You can't Mind tell, that, right? you can't even tell, like you can't tell who's white, who's Black, who's, you know, gay, mm -hmm. who's, white, who's, she is just a genius. Mm -hmm. and, but it takes almost that to break out of this cycle in genre. Yes, you mentioned something um, in particular referring to the Hunger Games. And you said how the districts all have kind of like people living in them, but they were kind of racially ambiguous. And then like Rue's district, uh, district 11, um, it, they all had people living there that, and it was supposedly this post-racial, um, this post-racial world. Do you think, can you imagine there is such thing as a post-racial future? Is that a big question? Oh, I mean, of course. I actually mm -hmm. do imagine. Now, um, one of the things, I do think that race is an artifact of the modern world. Mm -hmm. I think that we are transitioning to something else. I don't think that even the babies alive today are going to be here for a world where, um, you know, the, the consequences of modernity and the mm -hmm. racial order have completely dissipated. So we're moving mm -hmm. to something else and what that something else will be is not yet known and you know that's the one thing about my life that I'm sort of it's like it's almost like being living in or right before Shakespearean or you know like the renaissance or something or living mm -hmm. right um as the bronze age collapse was about to happen right. the fall of song guy so I've been watching mm -hmm. or and listening to the fall of civilizations podcast oh yes it's like 
it is so phenomenal. So I recommend and, that. It, you, yeah. you, oh my God. It's so that guy is like really knocking it out the ballpark. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of us are thinking about, wow. So if the order of things that we've had for the past few centuries is starting to, you know, maybe fall is, you know, not all civilizations fall, some collapse, some mm-hmm. uh, just gradually decline and become something else. Yeah. And so I think that post-raciality is not a goal. One of the mm-hmm. problems was early in the 2000s, you know, about 10, 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, really, in the early Bush administration. Here in this country, many of us believed we had attained post-raciality and mm-hmm. that belief was affirmed when Obama was elected president. Mm-hmm. So the mm-hmm. 2000s were really the post-racial oh. decade. Like we thought we yeah. had, you know, not everyone thought, but, you know, even <laughs> me, I thought, you know, I said, well, maybe this is you know, we'll have other things. We have class to deal with. We have militarism mm-hmm. to deal with. But mm-hmm. what we learned through the 2000s is that no one can declare when we're post-racial, just like mm-hmm. no one living in the 16th century could talk of, you know, could say when the medieval world was over or the 15th yeah. century, really, like the medieval world yeah. was sort of collapsing um, yeah. because of the little ice age and uh, black death, you know, there's global mm-hmm. plague you know, but really low isolation, climate change. And so, but nobody living at the time in the 15th or 16th century knew that or could put words to that. We're we're like those people living Mm -hmm. about 500, 600 years ago. Um, Yeah. yeah. I I love the reference to N.K. Jemison though, because it's like you mentioned, I, I, there was, she took down, she dismantled every, structure that I ever knew, even in the actual uh, writing of the book, <laughs> the characters. Yes. And I'm just like, yes, we're just fangirling because she's that awesome. <laughs> just for the Arthur genius grant and she should have. Like, I was so, oh so excited to see that she won that. Uh, so that's, that's a book that you latched onto and you said, this, this is wonderful. This is fantastic. Look at this exemplary do you have other books do you have other like recommendations for people I it's an author talk we always want to know about more <laughs> books that we should have on our shelves so I what mean, are some of those you, um you know so definitely Nora Jemison and Kay Jemison is fantastic um I another um series which is both a book series and also um a role-playing game and a mm. fabulous series is you know where I'm going with this the Expanse, starting with the novel Leviathan Wakes. Uh, Leviathan like Wakes. When the moon, well, I mean, I tweeted when the moon, you know, they said that Nokia has rights to the moon. I like tweeted mm. something like, I quote tweeted, um, you know, hums the Expanse theme song. So, <laughs> the Expanse, right. So the Expanse universe is sort of an, um, an anti-Star Trek and the author mm. and I are Twitter uh, mutuals. It's two authors, right? And mm. they're, they're so witty. Um, and I love Star Trek and the authors watch Star Trek, but they said, this is totally not our future. And so they extrapolate mm-hmm. our trajectory now with sort of the hyper-capitalism, our assumption that capitalism will fall and, mm-hmm. you know, and not just get even worse and extrapolates it out for you know to 300 400 years from now when we're mining the asteroid belt and that's like just ripped from the headlines because we know that you know the solution to climate change clearly is that we're going to mine the rest of the solar system so yes yes please read the expanse anything by Mm -hmm. nettie okorafor who Uh, is um an amazing nigerian american author mm -hmm. Um, from Chicago. She is creating sort of a new paradigm. So she's pushed back against her work being labeled as Afrofuturism because she said that's Mm -hmm. very much bound by sort of the transatlantic slave trade, Western Mm -hmm. concerns, responses to racism. What I'm writing is African futurism. And she recently came out with an anthology that you can download for free. And then finally, I have to give a plug to Faya Magazine. 
-hmm. I attended their um, recent uh, virtual convention as a guest. Um, the mm -hmm. Dark Fantastic was a finalist for one of their Ignite Awards. Mm -hmm. If you if you're reading science fiction and fantasy, where the genre is built is in the magazines. You know, mm -hmm. so that you know, Uncanny, mm -hmm. Strange Horizons, Fantasy and Science Fiction, Fantasy Magazine, Locus. So these mm -hmm. are this is the stuff that for the past several decades since the early 20th century have built you know um, genre mm -hmm. fiction and so Faya is an incredible um, magazine um, that is focused on publishing diverse science fiction and fantasy mm -hmm. from, every, mm -hmm. from authors of every background their mm -hmm. virtual Faya con last weekend was the best science fiction and fantasy convention I have ever attended it was amazing and it'll just be great when post-pandemic, we can get together. Mm -hmm. So definitely subscribe to FIA. Um, yeah, I, um, I guess I could end with, I read, there's a lot coming out now. I can't speak about 2020 yeah. books as much because mm -hmm. I'm on the National Book Awards panel. Mm. But um, yeah, so I can't, I'm not supposed to, not supposed mm -hmm. to, I've been kind of slipping. But uh, yeah, there, this is a, a, an amazing era for mm. all kinds of science fiction and fantasy. So just yeah. enjoy read broadly mm -hmm. and widely. <laughs> yes. And something I particularly love about Nanetti is she is uh, YA and she is also straight adult. And there's also uh, the new adult, kind of that middle genre. Uh, so there's a lot of her to explore. And she has a fantastic article exactly on the distinction between Afrofuturism Afro and African futurism. That article, highly recommend. I will uh, have to link it to this event. I'll find it drag it up and I will post it here in the show notes so that everyone can um, find that. Uh, so did Ebony, did you want to give us another uh, reading here? Oh, and I definitely would be happy to. This is the beginning of chapter five. Hermione is black. A postscript to Harry Potter and the crisis of infinite dark fantastic worlds. Books belong to their readers. John Green. As a biracial girl growing up in a very white city, I found myself especially attaching to the allegory of Harry Potter's blood politics. I related to her deeply, but like with so much um, I watched and read, I couldn't see myself in Hermione. Alana Bennett, what a race bent Hermione really represents the root. Words can't express how elated I am that it's common knowledge in 2015 that Hermione is Black. This is so beautiful, and I don't know what started it. If it was a text post, a race-bent fan cast, or people just collectively coming out and saying, hey, I thought that while reading the books too, but I am forever grateful. Brianna Harvey, Hermione is Black, Tumblr. Canon, brown eyes, frizzy hair, and very clever. White skin was never specified. Rolling loves Black Hermione. J.K. Rowling, Twitter, about the casting of Noma Dumaswini as Hermione in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. My immersion in Harry Potter fandom now seems like it was a lifetime ago. As I write these words, it has been almost 20 years since I opened my first Harry Potter novel, a hardcover copy of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets that one of my fifth graders left in the classroom. After failing to uncover its original owner, I took the book home over the weekend and immediately fell in love with the wizarding world. I devoured everything about Harry Potter that I could find online. <laughs> Just remembering it and then discovered fanfiction.net later that spring. By the time the fourth novel in the series, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire was released in the summer of 2000, I had discovered the Harry Potter for Grown Ups Yahoo group, HP4GU for short. From July 2000 until August 2006, I was a highly visible member of Harry Potter fandom. Online and in person, I openly used my real life professional name, Ebony Elizabeth Thomas, as well as the alias Angie J, short for Angelina Johnson, a black British witch in the novels. 
Digital Potter Mania in the early 2000s was an intimate online community that consisted of less than a thousand members and perhaps fewer than 100 regular posters across several websites, forums, and listservs. Within that small community, I was among the first and during its earliest days, one of the most prominent Black fans. My fandom participation was a daily event as I logged on eagerly after teaching and classes in the final few years before smartphones became ubiquitous. I volunteered for a number of Potter websites, including the Harry Potter for Grown Ups Yahoo group, Fictionally, and the now defunct pumpkinpie.org. I worked on the first Harry Potter fan initiated conference, Nimbus 2003 in Orlando, Florida, co-chairing one of two programming committees. And between 2000 and 2004, I wrote and posted a popular post Hogwarts fan fiction duology, Trouble in Paradise and Paradise Lost, which had beta readers from Britain to Brazil and enjoyed a broad international readership. Written between December 2000 and August 2001, Trouble in Paradise is narrated from the first person perspective of Angelina Johnson, a witch who is described in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire as a tall black girl who played chaser on the Gryffindor Quidditch team. Those 12 words introducing the only black character in the story, the only black girl character, in the story at the time, launched this dark, fantastic journey of mine, set 10 years after the Battle of Hogwarts, but written before the last three books in the series were published. Trouble in Paradise was the beginning of my recognition of the dark, fantastic cycle. Wow, that hearing your voice. I adore hearing authors read their own work because uh, when I go back through the work, I can, I can hear them, <laughs> hear, hear them there and uh, the passion there that comes out. Um, it, it's great hearing you read and you're laughing to yourself like, oh, I'm remembering this. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> yeah. That kind of nostalgia I can't get just from a reading. So uh, mm -hmm. just a quick moment of gratitude there for you for doing that. Uh, something that I found fascinating, um, and do you mind if I read a, a portion here? Um, yeah. yeah, now I get to listen. <laughs> yeah. So you said, um, as a fan of color, I was also curious about what the wizarding world might be like outside England. Without colonialism or slavery, how on earth did Black children end up at Hogwarts with English names? Adoption? Immigration? Or had witches and wizards of color somehow been somehow subjugated? Was their magic less powerful? That that was a fascinating point, and you kind of echoed it a little bit uh, later on. You say that books and movies about children and teens who looked like me were read and viewed out of duty in order to learn something about the past. Books and movies that showcased the pleasures of dreaming imagination and escape were stories about people who did not look like me. I thought that was a really fascinating point that you make later on here that even futuristic works still feature invasion, colonization, and conquest. These elements were very interesting. So did you, how did you wrestle with the idea of how did Black children end up at Hogwarts? And then what is your interpretation of why these elements of colonization come in and all these uh, very modern, as you were saying before, very modern elements come into these futuristic words, worlds where one might think we were past that? Yeah, I am um, at the time. So again, you know, revisiting, I'm 43 now. And so revisiting my 23 year old self, loving mm -hmm. Harry Potter, really immersing in the wizarding world. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote Trouble in Paradise for two reasons. First, we were embroiled in a major shipping war. So after reading Goblet of Fire, I assumed just from a lifetime of reading fantasy novels and school stories that, you know, um, Hermione and Ron would end up together. 
together. And for some reason, when I was 22, 23, and 24, I really, I really cared about who these kids would end up with 10 years. Mm -hmm. It seems a little creepy now, but we were, <laughs> seeing, yeah, but we were really thinking about the trajectory because we, Rowling told us that she was going to write the story until they came of age. And, you know, mm -hmm. she did it. And so we had a lot of fandom conversation about ships. So we were having our first ever, you know, sort of fandom conflict. So that was half the reason. Um, I knew that, so I really wanted to write an anti Ron Hermione story. So I became infamous mm -hmm. to this, especially among people like, like 90% of Harry Potter fans. Right? <laughs> They're like the dream team. Okay, yeah. so that's number one. That was my primary aim. Here's why I got the dark fantastic out of this 20 years later. Mm -hmm. I knew initially I could not, and I think, Paige, you know this, I wrote this in the book. Initially, mm -hmm. I felt like I couldn't write Hermione's through Hermione's shoes, like even in fan fiction, just because, again, Generation X, not millennial, I you know, knew that Hermione was not Black. We don't get cool characters like that mm -hmm. in mainstream, you know, fantasy, like especially growing up during the 80s, you know, like mm -hmm. you didn't get that. So I knew better, but Rowling gave me something that those 80s books had never given, which was a cool black girl. Like she was athletic. She had a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. so she like had stuff to do. She had, you know, the few lines she had, she was funny. I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, the glimpses, I can work with this. And so I made her what she became in canon, which was a Weasley sister-in-law. And so mm -hmm. she narrates sort of this soapy ribald take of the uh, the dissolution of mm -hmm. Ron and Hermione's. So like, I was just really, you know, having fun at other people's expense, which came back to haunt me later. So, <laughs> but a byproduct of that. So now if I'm in Angelina's shoes, I'm wondering why is my name Angelina Johnson? Mm -hmm. Why don't I have a Yoruba name? Why don't I have a Fulani name? Why don't I have a name that, you know, is, why is this my name? Because I'm thinking, well, you know, I mean, her name could be Angelina Johnson. She could be Black in a world without slavery, but without mm -hmm. colonialism and slavery, many of our names, even people who, you know, across the world would be very, very different, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, well, how did that happen? So mm -hmm. Angelina Johnson, and then it wasn't just her. We had another black child in the narrative, Dean Thomas. Mm -hmm. My last name's Thomas. Mm -hmm. My ancestors were not Thomases, probably. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to try to wrestle with the transatlantic slave trade mm -hmm. within my fan fiction. And so that was how I uh, you know, dealt with it and why I realized, I was like, well, this is kind of hard. You know, I kept running into walls. Like, why would yeah. someone with wizarding world level magic allow anyone to crowd them on a slave ship? And like, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know. And so I had to devise ways that their magic was stripped from them. And mm -hmm. it was still, you know, I don't know how plausible it was. So mm -hmm. um, the story was popular. Um, people who were in fandom at the time remember it. And mm -hmm. it earned me a page on fan lore, which is my claim to fame. I don't have a Wikipedia page, but I do have a fan lore page. It's <laughs> so that's much more claim. important. So right, I think that's cool. okay. <laughs> yeah, my students always say, that's cooler. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fantastic. I think that, um, I think that really thumbs up just what you've been saying about how this imagination gap it's just not it's just not something that you were given any kind of bare bones to work with and it's just incredibly exhilarating to read because you you frame it and you you frame it so well it seems effortless and yet we recognize how much hard work you did to to overcome and and just the gratitude that younger generations are discovering that now and and that's just an incredible incredible trajectory a incredible journey to watch and at the same time i really was very intrigued by the different frame the different lens that i was able to peer through for reading any anything else, any other future works of any author of any kind, I have an, a new lens through which to consider. So this is kind of like a big question. What, <laughs> what can readers do? What can writers do? What can readers do? What can we do next to 
about the dark fantastic what can we the collective do next what are next steps so here are some of the next steps i encourage for the collective um the first is to support diverse books so buy them check them mm -hmm. out from your libraries request them request fantasy and science fiction and uh horror by um diverse authors and um featuring diverse characters like mm -hmm. um you know immerse yourself in many mm -hmm. different stories from many different places um i get it i'm a huge fan of tolkien and c.s lewis um i was um i've been a pen pal of philip pullman's for mm -hmm. A long mm -hmm. time. That's another story for another visit. Um, but at the same time, you know, we need to support um, more diverse, more feminist, more queer, more everything um, in genre, in fantasy and science fiction, or else we won't have these kinds of books. So mm -hmm. support them. Um, I um, ask that you also um, consider, um, you know, writing um, diverse books, even if you don't think you're a diverse person. One of the uh, fictions of modernity is that, you know, when um, the Enlightenment constructed sort of this idea of the human, um, it encourages those, you know, all of us to identify or over identify with the human. So I know I'm a black, uh, black woman, but mm -hmm. I always always identified, you know, at, you know, with certain things like the parts of me that were more mainstream, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we're at a moment when people are engaged in um, individual and collective storytelling, where mm -hmm. we're all learning um, to embrace our creative sides. Mm -hmm. We're all realizing that we have a story to tell. You too have a story to tell. It may not be the story of race um, or ethnicity, but it could be a story of immigration. It could be a story of of um, losing cultural heritage. Maybe it's been mm -hmm. decades or centuries since your folks, you know, um, immigrated mm -hmm. to the States or wherever you are today. Um, mm -hmm. I would encourage you to, you know, deconstruct mm -hmm. your own, I, you know, your own self. And I think once mm -hmm. we begin to do that, once we begin to restore the self, once we begin that work, I think it will help us move to, um, true post-coloniality and um, mm. into shared futures. Beautifully put. I'm going to take this opportunity to encourage you to go to your local library immediately and your local bookstores and get this book. Thank you. Grab it. You need it on your shelf. You need it in your hands. You need it as a guide. Everyone needs this book. Uh, we have it at our Deschutes Public Library, and you can also find it anywhere books are sold, and you will not be disappointed. Ebony, I hope that you come out with the next half uh, of this book. I would, I would look forward to seeing that, uh, and I know that many people would. So if you ever get around to it, be the first to know. I'll be your beta reader, please, uh, oh, happily. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Stacy Donahue. I see someone I know in chat who has been watching today. Thank you so much for attending. And thanks to everyone in the audience and everyone who will watch the video later. I sincerely appreciate it. Good. Uh, so, Ebony, any final words for our audience today? I think you absolutely uh, wrapped it up just beautifully, probably without intending to, um, but any, <laughs> any final words for us? Well, I'll just close with the final words if I can flip to them quickly from um, the book um, where I say, um, this will take me a, a moment over, but I do wanna mm -hmm. like just uh, do this. All right, restoring fantastic traditions is one solution. An emancipatory dark fantastic is another. What would that look like? We already know. Mm -hmm. It looks like the groundbreaking singular vision of the late great MacArthur genius, Octavia Butler in novels from Kindred to Dawn and The Parable of the Sower. It looks like the work of Shireen Renee Thomas and her landmark anthology, Dark Matter, Adrian Marie Brown's Octavia's Brood, A Generation Later, and Nisi Shaw's short stories in a field that, according to a 2016 Fireside Fiction report, almost completely excludes authors of color. 
It looks like the dreams of Black women poets from Maya Angelou to Alice Walker, from Gwendolyn Brooks to Nikki Giovanni, from Lucille Clifton to June Jordan, and from Sonia Sanchez to Intozake Shange, who once said, I write for young girls of color, for girls who don't even exist yet, so that there is something there for them when they arrive. It looks like Virginia Hamilton's fantastic tales and folklore being a harbinger for those who would follow from Sherry L. Smith to Alea Don Johnson to Zeta Elliott. It looks like the Black Southern magical realism from Zorno Hurston to Tina McElroy Ansa and Jewel Parker Rhodes. It looks like Black Atlantic and Caribbean fantastic traditions from Tanana Reeve Dew to Nalo Hopkinson, from Rosa Guy to Marisa Conde, and from Edwidge Danticat to Mallory Blackman. It looks like the Hugo Award winning fantastic dreams of N.K. Jemison and Nettie Okorafor. It looks like the Black girl magic found in the lyrical contemporary realism of Jacqueline Woodson, Sharon Flake, Sharon Draper, Renee Watson, Nikki Grimes, Tanita S. Davis, Brandy Colbert, and all the authors of the Brown Bookshelf. It looks like a rising generation of stars from Evie Zaboy to Tracy Baptiste, Danielle Clayton to Tommy Yemi, Justina Ireland to L.L. McKinney, and so many other Black fantastic visions waiting in the wings. It looks like my niece Deja and my other nieces Alexis and Danielle's generation of Black girls and the generation after them and the generation after them. It looks like stories told and retold in the wake, dancing in Schroeder's pernicious box, shape-shifting beyond the gaps of the collective imagination. Ultimately, emancipating the dark fantastic requires decolonizing our fantasies and our dreams. It means the liberation of magic itself for resolving the crisis of race and our storied imaginations has the potential to make our world anew. Thanks for having me today. Thank you so much, Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, we encourage you to go to our YouTube page at the Shoots Public Library for this presentation and so many more, all brought to you for free. Uh, we can't do it without you, our community, and without our amazing presenters. So thank you all one more time, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care, everyone. Bye.